it. That's it. Okay. So there's no wrong answers. It's just a bit of fun. Your knowledge might be there. It might not be anywhere near yet. So hopefully you'll, we'll all learn a little bit of something. So should further weight loss be achieved for the day of your bariatric surgery? Oh, what can I ask a clarifying question? Mm. What, do you mean further weight loss from referral from tier three? Or do you mean further weight loss from when you saw the from medical you, team at Yeah, that's a really good question. So yeah, we can probably answer both of those questions. But yeah, from when you meet our team, from when you meet our team, do you, um, should further weight loss be achieved from meeting our team? So if you want to type something in the chat, if you want to put your hand up um, and I can... Well, I like that. Laura said, depends what the team say. Oh, that <laughs> makes me feel far too powerful. No, no. <laughs> no don't give Jodie the power. Yes, we've got lots of yes coming through. Ideally, yes. Um, somebody said as much weight loss as possible up to the day. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think we've got a pretty unanimous decision there. Brilliant. Okay, so let's have a little look at the answer and then we'll talk around it. Okay, so it is true. It's true, but maybe not for the reasons you think. Um, so the reason we all hope um, when we meet you that you will lose weight before surgery is all to do with your liver. So where we do our surgeries in the thoracic region and um, in there, there's lots of things and we want to get up to it. So you've got your stomach, you've got your liver, which is a whopper. It's like the size of a rugby ball. You've got the bottom end of your lungs, lobes of lungs coming in there. You've got even the section of your heart, your kidneys come up higher than you realize at the back and then all your intestines. So there's a lot going in there and your diaphragm. So in that space where we want to get in to do your surgery and um, to make it as easy as possible for our surgeons, we need to shrink that liver away. So we give you something called a liver reduction diet, which will get all the information about once you've met our team um, so that you can maximize the fluid loss from that liver. And it's just kind of sucked out of our way for surgery. Um, so yes is the answer. Um, I, I like some of the comments you all, you guys were making. Oh, you know, as much weight as you can lose is brilliant, and that is brilliant because the, the you know the lighter you are, the easier the surgery in other respects. But also, don't beat yourselves up too much either. For some people, just achieving that five percent um, in tier three, which is the kind of what the commissioners. Um, set as a criteria for being referred on to bariatric surgery which is um one that we've debated many times um but essentially you're not here because the weight loss is really easy and achievable you're here because you're going to make lifestyle changes which hopefully will lead to weight loss during the time with your weight management team that then will help you qualify for bariatric surgery um so yes to both it's lovely if you can lose more weight but once you've met our team everybody loses weight with the liver reduction diet in that two to four weeks before surgery thanks Shoddy. if you um are lighter on the day of surgery um does that put you under less risk when going under anesthetic um, our anaesthetists are fantastic and they don't worry too much about whether people are obese or not. People come into the hospital all the time for surgeries and one in four of us are now obese. So we're very experienced. So it would be almost false for me to go, oh yeah, you're much safer the thinner you are. And there is a truth in that, absolutely. There can be increased risks with um, being obese as they can be for lots of things, which I'm sure you're all aware. Every time your GP sees you, goes, oh, if you could just lose some weight. Um, so yes, essentially, it's brilliant the more weight you can lose. And the other thing is, if you do lose weight and you go to the point where maybe you're BMI below 40 or a BMI below 35 and you're still losing weight um, and it comes to your surgery date, just because you've lost that weight doesn't mean you don't then qualify for your surgery. You can absolutely have your surgery. You've earned it, you've worked towards it, and this will hopefully give you some more meaningful weight loss and then help you achieve your goal of lifelong weight loss using it as a tool. Um, so don't be concerned about that either if you are losing weight well. And it might be to, at that point you actually go, well, actually, I don't think I actually need the surgery now. So no one's going to force you down that road either. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to address, a few people said this is my first session, so I'm not really sure what's going on. I'll just clarify, um, this isn't usually the setup of the session. Um, Jodie's pulled together a quiz for the end of the year. Um, so we are just going through this quiz. I'm going to talk around a few points that have come up 
come up and uh, a few members of the MDT team have sent their questions in at Salford, the MDT at Salford, so that's surgeons, medics, anaesthetists, isn't it? Um, so they've sent questions into Jodie um, that they really want you guys to know about. Um, so that's what we're doing. So apologies, this isn't the usual setup, but I, I'm actually having a great time so far. <laughs> um, there's actually a, follow, uh, a different question there, Jodie, following on from that, which I think is probably worth answering. Um, so Jess has asked, how does the doctor know the liver is covering the area he wants to work with? It always so, does. It just sits in that area. And you're, if you've all seen a liver, um, it's kind of squishy and that's something called glycogen. And when the liver reduction diet is very good at targeting that glycogen and literally sucking it out the way. Now, some people may have sort of a condition called fatty liver where the fat infiltrates the, the um, liver and that even with the liver reduction diet that can potentially shrink down but it perhaps won't as much and the, the, the surgeon will let you know. Um, there's only been one case I've known of in six years where they've had to, to start the procedure and then abandon the procedure because the liver was too large for them to, to um, continue safely. Uh, so it really does do what it says on the tin, it really does help shrink it out of the way. But in that case they would open somebody up and then close them back up wouldn't they? If they yeah if they and open, open up and close up is, is kind of old school. Well, Tiny little, little hole tiny and then little close it. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> don't want you to have that kind of image. Yeah. <laughs> Old school where there was the big incision. What do I know? Yes, you can still have surgery if you have fatty liver. It's something that we're aware of. People would do get with obesity. Perfect. You ready for your next question? Yeah, right then. So the next question. You should stay in bed for at least 24 hours after your bariatric surgery. Mm. Oh, Laura's fast off the mark there. Oh, I love it. I love it. Wow. They're really flying. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. So, yeah, I think there's a really good consensus there that's kind of get understands the importance of getting up and around as soon as possible. So the answer is no, um, we don't want you to stay in bed for at least 24 hours after surgery. I think what does happen and what is common is that when you're in a hospital environment, um, and you might not think it'll happen to you, but it pretty much happens to everyone, you get, you, you're not really in control of that environment. There's lots of things going on around you. You feel like perhaps you shouldn't bother anyone. It's easier to stay to your bed area. And um, so just by the fact of you being in hospital, you're gonna probably be less mobile. And then obviously while you're an, under your anesthetic and in recovery and on when you're coming around from your surgery you're not mobile at all so that's why it's quite important that once you open up you're down in the um, ward environment um, that you do um, make sure that you can move in the bed perhaps sit out in your chair and we don't put catheters in anyone so go into the bathroom and back um, and even though at first you can feel quite uh, like a sort of a tightness or a pulling across where your abdominal wounds are and when we do your surgery we fill you up with a carbon dioxide gas so that we can see easily where our laparoscopes go and after this procedure that gas just kind of goes out of those little laparoscopic wounds and um, we don't leap on you to squash the gas out so unfortunately sometimes you can have little pockets left in so again it's really important that you get movement moving because you don't want to get that horrible trap wind pain which as I think all of us know can be really painful um, and you'll know if you've got that because pain like that can actually transfer to your shoulder tips and your collarbone um, and obviously we'll cover that in more detail when you come to the education sessions um, but it's just things to be aware of by moving you also ward off loads of complications that can be common after surgery um, and you a gut motility you've got this brand new stomach and system um, so when you're having little tiny sips at first it can just kind of sit very heavy and you can end up like a block pipe and air has to come down and you might burp quite a lot you might be quite bilious and to help that happen moving around and then once things go down you start seeing it going down moving around and mobility is really really important it also helps you stop getting um, blood clots um, and ward off things like chest infections um, so in the hospital We'll give you pain relief because there'll be certain things that I really want you to try and do, even if it's just in the bed, picking up your knees, twiddling your ankles, holding your thumb and doing this movement. It's proven to aid gut motility. So if you're in bed and you you've just do a few of these exercises every hour, then the other thing I like to do is a nice deep breath. And then I like you to do a huff. 
and then it's kinder than a cough. This will help keep your um, keep your lungs clear and also it's movement all across your diaphragm and laparoscopic wound area. So even though that might seem to you like, oh no, I don't want to touch it, don't we? This might be sore. I want you to heal so that those layers um, move around properly like they should because you have your skin layer and you have your stomach muscle layer. And as we twist and bend and go like this and hoover, all those are moving against each other. So when those little wounds are healing, we want you to have that range of movement. So movement is the number one most important thing straight after surgery, even if it's just little movements in bed, sitting yourself up. And if you can't do those breathing exercises, if you're struggling to sit yourself up that bed, then you need extra pain relief. And that's how you gauge your pain. You might be sore and tender for sure, because it's a major surgery. Um, but in terms of pain relief and when you need it, it's if you can't complete tasks that we'd like you to be able to do. Um, and that's when you definitely need something to take the edge off, give it a good half hour, 20 minutes, something like this. And then you should find that you've got enough effect that you can now sit yourself up easily and so on. Somebody's asked there, Jody, how long is the hospital stay usually? So ideally you will come in on the day of surgery and all being well, go home the following afternoon, evening. Perfect. Thank you. Um, ready for the next one? Okay. So... There are two types of dumping syndrome. Now, some of you might not even know what dumping syndrome is. So the question is, are there, rather than there are, are there two types of dumping syndrome or not? I feel like we need a fancy like, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. Da <laughs> Good, people are asking what it is as well. So all those saying yes, you need to now answer the question. <laughs> yeah, what are the two types? <laughs> okay. Next again there. Brilliant. Yeah, so I don't expect everybody to know what this is. Um, you can get, and Stevie's great, she records a lot of these sessions, and there's one by Dr. Syed, and he explains it beautifully. He's so clever. Um, I really like listening to his talks. So he's talked about dumping syndrome in great detail, but essentially, um, I don't like the word because dumping syndrome does imply some of the symptoms you might get. Um, but there are indeed, if you just move it onto the next slide, Stevie, um, there are two types of dumping. There's early dumping and there's late dumping. So I'll just read what Dr. Akil says. So there is an early stage and a late stage to dumping syndrome. Early dumping symptoms off occur within 10 to 60 minutes after food caused by a dumping of solid food into your intestine with rapid shift of fluids into the small bowel. I can't read what he says because it's not my words. I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> I'm reading it again. It's so dumping syndrome is basically where you eat or drink something that's just that bit too sweet. So it could be a fresh orange juice or it could be a smoothie um, or too starchy. So it could be, oh, I'm, I'm going to have this nice buttery mashed potato in my pureed stage. And it's a starchy carb and it might have a bit too much fat from the butter in or too greasy. So those three things can cause dumping syndrome, syndrome after a bariatric surgery. And the reason why is because once the swelling's gone down and you're healing food, or drink goes very quickly into your small intestine and your body's not used to this. It doesn't know why that's happening. So something will come into the system and it'll be like, ah, it's too sweet. It's not right. We shouldn't have this here. We need to flush it out. It is an offensive item. So um, your body will steal fluid from your circulating blood volume. So water essentially to flush out your bowel. Now, when that happens, your blood pressure drops. So you're suddenly thinking, oh God, I feel a bit dizzy. I feel a bit a bit off and not quite right. So you're gonna sit down, you're gonna raise your feet, ideally above our, um, heart level, and think to yourself, what have I had to eat or drink in the last um, in the last 10, 20 minutes or up to an hour that could be causing this issue? Um, and then very quickly, your body will put it correct, right, but sometimes you might get diarrhea because it's trying to flush that item out, um, or you might get symptoms of late, dumping which can happen maybe um, an hour or three hours after whatever the offensive item is and it's usually something that was too sweet because your blood sugars um, are now messing around so they don't 
a lot quite a bit of sugar's gone into your system because again it's not being digested in that stomach it's gone quite quickly into your small bowel so your body again is not keen on that so your insulin is all being produced all oh, quick counteract this and um, so suddenly your blood sugars might go quite high then they might dip down and that can cause you to get palpitations and feel sweaty and maybe your heart will race a little bit um, but again, your body is super clever. It will correct it all. It will be absolutely fine. But for that experience, you really can feel quite unwell. And I've given you the very worst case of dumping syndrome. You might just get all of those things very mildly where you just feel a bit off and you're not quite right. And the next time you go to the loo, it's a bit runny. But it, it, I just like to explain things in the worst scenario so that you know what it could potentially be like. Um, and then you tend to find that you will recognize whatever it was that you had. So it might be like, like I say, it could just be that you had too big a glass of orange juice and it was just too much sugar. Um, and then you'll be like, oh, whatever it was, I'm never having it again, that petty falou or whatever caught you out. So that's what dumping syndrome is. Um, it tends to buffer out around the two, 18 months to two years after surgery. Some people... Um, definitely get it some people have had foods where they thought they would have it and haven't had experience dumping at all so it can be quite individual but it's it's a common thing after surgery and most people don't get it simply because they follow all the dietary advice that we give you by avoiding those things so you never experience it um so maria said so can you avoid it by eating healthily then yeah, and, and, and after surgery, um, we tailor that liquid diet and then into the puree and then into mash with a fork textures and then into textured food. All the choices you'll be making, you'll have guidance with our dietitians. Um, and we can, you know, for some people, they, they it's bad luck. One person can eat a petit falou, the next person gets dumping syndrome off a petit falou. So there is a little bit of that. Very rarely do we ever get anyone go, oh, I know, I'll have something really rubbish. Um, I know I should really have that could cause dumping just to see if I get it um, because you generally don't feel like you want it. It's not the kind of food that you, you know, you're, the, the bariatric surgery initially can really stem all hunger anyway. Um, so the choices you're making are almost like a bit of a robot. It's like you're weaning a newborn baby. Um, so you're weaning your stomach back onto a normal diet. Um, so you, you don't tend to make really rubbish choices, you tend to make really good choices because you're prepared and you want to get through it and get back to that nice solid stage where you could enjoy half a steak and chips and salad, albeit a very small portion, but you, you should get back to that um, textured food that's, that you can um, enjoy and be more social with because food is a huge part of our lives. Thanks Jodie. Okay, so does bariatric surgery cure diabetes? And we're talking about type 2 diabetes. So there's been quite a few questions around diabetes as well. People asking if they can have surgery if they've got diabetes, things like that. You can have surgery whether you've got type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Well, I like that maybe thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Very expressionate. Mm. Oh, no, someone just someone just hit it on the head. Wonderful. So yeah, so the word remission is what we like. It's a bit of a trick question. So let's look at the next slide, Stevie. Absolutely. Type 2 diabetes can be put into a partial or full remission after bariatric surgery. It's amazing. So say you got diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at the beginning of the year and had bariatric surgery at the end of the year, it is highly likely your diabetes will go into remission. All the bad things that diabetes can cause, um, issues with eyes, feet, um, your organs, things that um, can make life hard as you get older, um, you should be on a completely different path. So essentially, you, that is why very often people say it cures your diabetes, but we don't like that word because if you have had diabetes for any length of time, you should still have your eyes and feet checked annually. Um, and until your HbA1c, which is a clever measure of your blood that shows that you don't have a diabetes diagnosis, so it should be 42 or below, um, until that's consistent, then um, you'd still want some monitoring of the condition for, for um, the short term anyway. 
Okay then, so Lucinda, who is one of our consultant endocrinologists, and some of you may know her if you're in the Salford weight management process, she says, in some cases, diabetes go into full remission, meaning you may no longer require medications. You will always need to continue attending clinics for management of eyes and feet checkups. So yeah, that's basically what I was just saying. Um, one thing we do see is if somebody's had it for like half their life, um, they may just find the whole, con the whole condition is much easier to manage. Um, almost everybody goes without diabetes medication straight after surgery, simply because during the liquid phase of the diet, you're, very little is going in. Um, so you don't need to be on those medications to lower your blood sugar because you're just simply not having the carbohydrates and sugars that you would have normally been having prior to surgery. But we guide you with this, so you don't need to worry. Um, we'll let you know what you should be doing, um, especially straight after surgery. Somebody's asked Jodie, um... Does it matter what type of um, surgery you have in terms of remission from diabetes or um, yeah, so are they all the same? I think it's a really good question. And the long term data supports that the gold standard bariatric surgery for putting um, type 2 diabetes into remission is a Roux on Y gastric bypass. Um, however, I've nursed many people that have had the sleeve, maybe for different reasons they've chosen the sleeve. Um, and they've still had a remission or a partial remission of the diabetes because the diet changes so much. And most, well, type two diabetes is diet related. So we're still seeing good remissions. And I think that's more to do with the individual, how they use the tool um, and attending follow-up um, and attending the uh, post-op support groups and things like that. It just helps keep you on track. Um, so yeah, we see it in all of the surgeries, but if you were doing your research and looking at the scientific data, it will always support the real and why as being the best option for type two di people with type two diabetes. Um, and one more on that point. Um, Kath has just said, I've had diabetes for 15 years. Can I still go into remission? It would be less likely. A partial remission would be brilliant. A reduction in your medications and finding your um, blood sugar readings much more stable um, would be would be kind of like optimizing the management of your condition, which again is good for your long term health and well being. So I would I would very cautiously uh, be very cautious about ever saying to somebody who's had a type two diabetes for more than five years that it would go into remission. Um, I think that would be false hope, but it would definitely make it easier to manage. Thanks, Jodie. And move on to the next one. Yeah. <clears throat> Right, so social media is an excellent source of information relevant to the surgical options here at Salford. <laughs> Lies. <laughs> Lies. Okay. I'm going to interject here, unless it's my YouTube channel, which has got all these videos on. <laughs> I think there's so much good stuff out there, but we have to be cautious. It's like anything, like whatever field you guys are all in or wherever, you, you know, maybe you're a parent, maybe you, you've got a, a, a professional a qualification in something. When you see stuff about your field of expertise, you're always a bit like, oh, it's not quite represented how it is. Um, but however, some stuff can be really interesting. You go away and look at it and think, oh, no, well, that, that could stand true. So I think social media in any walk of life is fine, but with a pinch of salt, you just sometimes it's not helpful. Um, I've had lots of lovely experiences with patients where they've um, there's, they built up some camaraderie. They may have all been done on the same day and they started a WhatsApp group. Um, so it's can be really supportive but then you also have to be aware of each other too because it doesn't mean that uh, that, that everyone else is an expert or what's happening to one person well why isn't that happen to, happening to me so you do get that backlash sometimes uh, where well I'm losing this you should be losing that amount of weight and I've I can eat this one, you shouldn't be eating that. So sometimes it can get a little bit lost in being helpful. So it's like anything, isn't it? Sometimes we go on Facebook and we're like, oh, this is really nice. And other times you look at it and you just think, Ugh. Um, so you, it's it's like anything, it can be useful, but the, the key point here is challenge anything with the professionals. And if you are part of a bariatric support group or your own support groups, just sometimes ask yourself, do I truly feel supported? Is this a forum that's causing me anxiety? Um, because your mental health is really important um, as well. When the bariatric surgery, like almost 
I think I really believe it's one of the ones where it's very much body and mind. Um, so if ever you're in those situations where you're thinking, you know, what, this isn't as hope as helpful, just take a break um, and challenge anything with us if you're not sure. People have put a few examples there where social media has said something and it's turned out not to be true. Um, oh, okay, go on. So one of them um, says that they saw on social media that you couldn't have um, bariatric surgery if you've got acid reflux. No, that's not true. But there are types of surgery we might steer you away from, or we might like to investigate a bit more what your reflux is like to see if options, which options are best for you. Um, so sometimes the sleeve gastrectomy isn't, wouldn't be our first choice if somebody had an established condition called GORD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease. So this is where they're regularly getting reflux all the time, only because it could potentially worsen it. Um, so as when you come and meet our team, we will give you the benefit of our expertise after assessing you as an individual. Um, so no, that, that's not true. If you've got reflux, um, something like the real Y bypass would be a really good choice. And in, in fact, there have been cases of people who are not obese having a real Y bypass to try and get rid of reflux. So. Really? That's interesting. And do, do those people manage to stay a healthy weight? Yeah, that yeah, research. essentially, I because they get sometimes have this procedure done under general surgery. So I'm always like, well, feed them into us because I think the support is so important with this surgery because it's such a big lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. The very basics of everything you've ever done is challenge. You, you know, I've got this glass of water here and I'm sipping it. But if I was super thirsty and you guys weren't there, I'd probably just knock the whole thing back. Well, after surgery, you can't knock a whole drink back. You're always going to have to take the sipping option. And there's just that may sound like, oh, that's no big deal. But actually, when you're out the other side of surgery, you really do have to kind of um, live it to understand it. But right now, you just need to have some tools to go, oh, right, yeah, they, they did say this. I need to slow down. Maybe I've been going a bit too fast or, or whatever it might be. You've just put that lady's mind at ease anyway. Um, she was panicking because she'd seen that on social media. So thanks, Jodie. You ready for the next one? Everyone's sipping now. We're all sipping our drinks. <laughs> oh, I really struggle to sip a drink. You can see me, I gulp my water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's funny. But obviously after surgery, you have to, because otherwise you learn the hard way and it just yeah. rebounds back up or you just get these like, kind of like this sort of block pipe feeling that takes ages to go away. And then when it does, you're absolutely fine again. But very quickly, you, you learn how to live with it and how to, um, to make sure you avoid those situations. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Right, next question. During your stay in hospital, you may be offered meals that are inappropriate for you on your recovery diet. Do you think that would happen? Oh. I think I'm going to go against the grain with my answer, you know. What's your answer? I think, yeah, mistakes happen everywhere. So maybe somebody might offer you something that... It, yeah, I, I think you're all right there where you're going, no, that shouldn't happen. And I agree with you. But working in the NHS, um, where we've got real constraints, um, we've got staffing crises, people aren't, don't always go back to the ward where we normally look after the patients. So if we look at the next slide. Oh, sorry. It's true. I'm sorry. Um, majority of the time it wouldn't happen. Um, but if you can imagine, um, you know, somebody comes onto the ward and they're asked to go and do, oh, can you just go around and offer everyone a tea and a coffee? So they'll come to you and they'll go, what do you want? Hot chocolate, this, that, this, that, the other. So you just have to kind of empower yourself to be able to go, oh, um, I just, just half a glass of milk is all I'm allowed at the moment. And we'll guide you where you're up to. Normally there's a board behind your bed and it'll say sits only or free fluids or whatever. So there is always a guide, but it's never a perfect system. So I guess really what I'm trying to say, and with all healthcare professionals in the future, I want to empower you to feel that you can tell people that you've had bariatric surgery and what it means. For example, if you were di uh, given some medication and on the side of the packet it said to have with food, well, that doesn't mean anything to you. You haven't got a large stomach anymore where food and this medication will sit together churning around for two hours. It's going to go through quite quickly. So you don't need to take medications with food. Um, and whoever's prescribing it, you might just need to remind them of that as well. Um, going kind of back to the diet stage, you're with us for a very short period of time. So it's definitely only going to be clear fluids and liquid. Um, so, uh, sorry, not clear fluids, 
clear fluids on day one, free fluids usually on day two. And that's only once I've come to see you or, or the round have come to see you to go, yeah, they're, they're doing OK, let's progress you. Um, so if you stay in hospital for a little bit longer, this might be because um, the pain's just a bit too much, you need a bit more morphine, um, or it might be that you've got another condition that we want to keep an eye on, so you might stay for another night or two, then you'll have the, um, the delights of things like clear soup and free uh, clear jellies, uh, sugar-free jellies, diabetic ice cream, um, and then you're gonna need to ask for milk in between your meals, so when they do come round, um, you can't eat and drink together. And very often everyone will offer you a drink with your food at the same time. Um, so there's just little things that you just have to be aware of and, and, uh, and, and not feel sad, uh, not feel worried to be to say, oh no, I can't have that. Um, and your nurse will know and obviously we'll guide them, but it does happen. So just trying to empower you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm multitasking then. Um, somebody um, said oh, yeah. that they get, they had a real life experience of that happening after they'd had their gallbladder, no, half their liver out. I've lost it, too so many people have posted. Um, yeah, ha um, half the pancreas removed, that's it. They were offered juice and sugar on cereal. It's about... Yeah. And the other thing, even if it? I tra even if I've done some training um, where we've got regular wards and I've got like um, staff champions for the bariatric side of things, um, it's really hard for people to give you the amount of food. Your family are going to find it hard to give you the amount of food that you'll be having, um, because even when you sort of progress into the more solid stage of the diet, it could just be two tablespoons of something at a meal, and that will feel enough for you. So people can't help themselves, and when you when I'll say, well, can you just serve them in like a, an old fashioned teacup, some clear soup? Very often it'll just come in a big bowl right to the top. You know, oh, we've not had anything. They must have a nice hearty bowl of soup and some clear jelly. Um, and really, if you had six teaspoons of each in one meal over for your very first meal the next day, um, over 20 minutes, that would be fantastic. And then very quickly, you'll soon find having um, three quarters of a cup of soup um very easy to do but straight away you'll you'll go going nice and slow and nice and steady and building it up over the first three days so that by the time you're there you're having a good liter and a half volume um all day long and then chris will guide you well, let's say chris our dietitian but chris is the main dietitian he'll um he'll make sure with all the patient information and the education before that you've got a good understanding how you increase that so you don't get dehydrated and um, could you um kind of clear up why we can't eat and drink at the same time post-surgery lots of people ask because of the the space so whether you've had a sleeve or a bypass surgery your stomach is essentially the size of a boiled egg yeah so it's not huge so when it comes to having nutrition um to get the most value out of it you just want to focus on that. So your your liquid meal or or even any meal when you're up to like full diet you just wouldn't have the capacity to have half a glass of water and a tea plate full of food because it will be traveling down and emptying into your small bowel. It doesn't just sit in that small pouch. But if you put too much in in one go, it can feel quite painful where the pouch is. So we don't want you over time stretching that anatomy out because that little tummy we want to, to be kept small. Um, so by separating eating and drinking, you find that you can enjoy your meal without feeling over full. And then you'll half an hour or 15 minutes later, you'll be fine to have that drink. Um, so it's already to do with capacity and getting the value out of what you're having. Um, and then quite a few people are asking, what's the rule of 20? So the rule of 20 is ace, um, do it for Christmas for a bit of fun, see how you get on. So the rule of 20 is um, you get a teaspoon with a, the, a portion of food on the end of it that's the size of a 20p piece. You put it in your mouth, put your teaspoon down, 20 seconds before you have the next 20 pp's mouthful, um, uh, mouthful. You chew 20 times. And then after 20 minutes, if you haven't completed that meal, you leave it. So it's all about pacing yourself. Um, if you think of your stomach only being the size of a boiled egg and you're now on full textures, so you're attempting that steak I was talking about, you need to really chew that down because your mouth is now doing a lot of what the 
your stomach used to do if it was churning away trying to digest something that you ate fast and um, so now you do have to slow down so um, mindful eating is quite a good thing to look up as well that's something that at ABL we talk about as well, um, mm -hmm. the rule of 20 and mindful eating and, you know, practicing putting our knives and forks down in between bites. Um, so I'm sure lots of the, the services do talk about that. Um, you ready for the next question? Yeah, let's go. Okay, you will be seen by the bariatric team every three years for the rest of your life. Is that true or is that false? I'm going to invest in some countdown music. I know people are coming up with some good stuff as well. Thank yeah. you so much for all you people with your speedy fingers typing in. It's nice to get a vibe of what you all think. That's fine. Okay, so on to the next slide. It's fine. Follow up for the rest of your life is something that nowhere on the universe offers but Salford Royal. We see you every year for the rest of your life. So long as you depend, as long, so long as we've not cancelled anything like we had to because of COVID, um, or if you don't attend, um, then I think it's the rule in the hospital is if you don't attend an appointment twice, they discharge you. So just make sure that if ever you can't make that a yearly appointment, that you do let them know so they can rebook it in and you don't get lost. Um, initially, the follow up's completely different. So I'll come and find you the day after your surgery, whether it be in fate, by face or by phone. Um, then I'm, you can't get rid of me. I'm ringing you the week after that. Um, you have my number, you have Chris's number, um, email details and so on as well. Um, but week three, the dietitians phone you. Week six, me and the dietitian phone you. Being me and the dietitian phone you and I hope by that stage you never need to see your surgeon ever because it means everything's gone as it should be you don't need a surgical opinion and then you'll carry on with the dietitian for the following um couple of years and intermixed amongst those couple of years will be your first medical weight management appointment um which you then follow on yearly for life so it's a really good um follow-up and statistically people do better when they attend the follow-up um there's a question there um i'll ask this two ways so is this the same if you go privately so that might be if you're put on a private list oh yes yeah. so assaulted. where we can and what we're trying to do and what we used to have which is harder now um is contracts with private providers so it's our um surgeons using the theatre space and then the um, nursing and dietitian teams in private facilities to be able to do our NHS lists um, and that's been really important to us in the past and it's something that, that stopped during Covid which is why our lists have gone up um, and also we're now trying to get more of these contracts but uh, private work has become so popular they're not as keen to give NHS contracts anymore so we have got um, elective surgery happening it's in a small um, way but it is happening um, and we use we use a private facility at the moment but those contracts are short and then we hope to get another one and so on and so on so everything's just not quite as it should be the whole NHS is a little bit broken at the moment and it's not just because of COVID it's because of the staffing crisis we've never had so many people leave the profession we've never had so many, so many people poached from the profession because again the private world's really booming and um, so it, it, there's lots of different multi-factors that have made bariatric surgery a much longer process which is why these sessions mean a lot to me and a lot of people that are attending them and we do say now just completely change your mindset it's a it is a longer journey we do want to do your surgery and we will get there in the end and um, but the, the waits can be you know over a year just to come and meet our team from referral it's seven months at the moment i'm really hoping that's going to improve and it will because I, I, you know it will but it, it is a much longer journey now i'm afraid Okay, let, I'm deviating, but I know a lot of you wanted to hear about that anyway. And if um, if somebody chooses to go and pay privately? So it's like anything in this world. If you want to pay for it, you can get it. And you can get some really amazing packages out there, I believe. Um, so you don't just pay for the surgery and the surgeon writes a nice letter to your GP saying, oh, they've had some bariatric surgery. 
give them a couple of these medicines and so on. Um, you can pay to have the nurse, the dietitian, the psychology, I think is probably more important than anything. Um, if you if you considered um, needing psychology, because I don't think we're not really switched on as a nation to think we need psychology, but actually we, we all do to some point. Um, and I think with um, changes of, of lifestyle, it's so important that they're addressed um, prior to surgery, really. So there's all kinds of things that you, that you can pay for, um, but they're things that we offer you within the NHS once you once it's, um, funded for bariatric surgery. Ready for the next one? Yeah. Okay, so your GP doesn't have to supply your supplements after surgery. Is that true or is it false? Okay then, so after bariatric surgery, it doesn't matter how much spinach you eat, you'll never get everything you need from diet alone. So um, you're not suddenly going to be depleted in everything because you've had bariatric surgery, but maybe year seven, year 10, or a couple of years down the road, something might be getting a little bit low. So we monitor those bloods annually. Um, and, uh, and right from the get go, we'd get you into a habit and a routine of taking tablets throughout the day. Because you, again, you wouldn't want to take all your tablets in one go because it would feel like a breakfast and then you wouldn't manage your nutrition. So supplements are a really important thing that you understand you need to have. There are lots of different ways you can have supplements. The GP, oh, just pop it onto the next slide, doesn't have to supply your supplements any longer because there are lots of things changed, just like they don't have to give you paracetamol. They don't have to give you dietary drinks. They don't have to give you vitamins and minerals. Um, now we're pretty good rapport with our GPs. Um, and when I write to them and explain, please, can we have this, that, and the other, very rarely, do people not get them prescribed? Okay, because there's, there's things that we particularly want you to do. We have a body of evidence of, of, of why we suggest the supplements that we do. Um, and GPs are usually so delighted by all the wonderful weight loss benefits you're about to experience that they're more than happy to support you with that prescription. We also have people that look at the NHS and they say, well, actually, I'm really glad that I can have my surgery on it, but I, I, I'm happy to pay for my supplements. That's not a problem for me. And that's what I choose to do. Um, but if, the, if you had a GP practice, they were very kind of sticklers and they were like, no, we don't have to do this. So we're not. It's usually the multivitamin they won't prescribe. I mean, normally we can get everything else. Um, so if you think of multivitamins, when you go to the shop, we want you to have something called A to Z complete. And on the bottle, it'll say once a day, but because you've had bariatric surgery, you're going to have to have it twice a day. You can't get the cheapest version, I'm afraid. It does have to be an A to Z complete one. So that could incur you a cost of up to about £15 a month. Um, so I do think you have to think about that as well, because not every surgery people have on the NHS, on the NHS is there a cost, a monthly cost afterwards to, for the, for your health and well-being. Um, so something to be aware of, hopefully something that won't be an issue for you. Um, but that's the state of play at the moment with the GP formularies and what they have to, what they don't have to. But as I say, I very rarely have an issue um, getting them to prescribe everything you need. Um, somebody's just asked Jodie, how about the medication you were on previously, uh, before, prior to your um, surgery? So like epilepsy medication, yeah, it's all still the same, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the things you have to bear in mind is if you're going through a rapid weight loss, so that's about 40% of your excess fat over the first four to six months. And um, that can make a big change for some of the medications you take. And you find that some things, um, oh, someone's just commented, I'm just sorry, that just caught my eye. The money you save on food, you can, can cover your vitamins. And I think that's a really good point, actually, because you are going to be a very cheap date for, for quite a long time. Um, so yeah, that's a really valid point. Um, so yeah, so medications wise, if you think you've suddenly lost all this weight, and maybe you were put on something like, I don't know, um, an antihypertensive, so something to keep your blood pressure down. So if you've got high blood pressure, and it's definitely due to obesity, and then you're um, losing lots of weight and you're still taking the same level of uh, blood pressure tablets um, that you don't need anymore then a norm you might have a normal blood pressure which is now going to go be lowered 
to one that could potentially be a bit dangerous and you feel faint and dizzy because you don't need your blood pressure and lowering. Um, so things do change with medications. I've not noticed so much with epilepsy medications, they've stay, tend to stay the same. Um, some things will improve, some things could potentially get worse. And, and I don't mean that in a horrible way. It's just if you've got lots of um, aches and pains and chronic pain, um, which is notoriously very difficult to manage. Um, I think the GPs have overhauled advice that they used to give. They don't pour lots of opiates and lots of gabapentins and lots of everything on, on pain anymore because they realise it, it doesn't always uh, um, help. Um, so essentially your gait, your posture could change with weight change. So you, um, we've had people where they've needed new knees, but then with all the weight loss they've done and um, exercises they've done, they didn't need the new knee knees anymore, which is amazing. So it's a bit of a journey afterwards. So it can feel like you take two steps back and then three steps forward. And, and it, it's a bit of a journey. And then usually around the 18 months to two years, you'll know what you're left with. You'll know, oh, this is me now. And this is kind of the things I need to address um, with other conditions. Uh, there's quite a few people asking about different medications. So okay, well, I may I've, say, I've... have a little look at the pharmacy link and I won't give you loads of spoilers because I could, talk all night to be fair <laughs> um, so uh, we, we, we might keep it a little bit more to the quiz um it might come up in there so don't want, feel disheartened if any questions you've got haven't been answered yeah. i've posted um, that specific um yeah i really like the pharmacy one and in the new yeah. year we get them to all come back in so if there's changes and it gives you opportunity to, to ask very specific questions there as well yeah there you go next one right so all medications have to be taken as a liquid um, in the first three weeks after surgery. What do you think? Brilliant. So yeah, I think a lot of you are getting the gist um, that it, it does depend sometimes what you're on. Um, so let's go through to the next slide. Thank you, everybody. So it's false. Only essential medications will be taken after surgery. So you, all the medications you come in with, you won't necessarily need in the first three weeks after surgery. So our pharmacy looks at that for you, talks you through it. Then they'll look at what you do need to take and decide with you and what's on the formulary that we can look at to make it as easy as possible in that liquid phase. So if there's a liquid available, we'll have it. If it's effervescent, like the fizzy ones, we really don't like those because fizzy doesn't agree with surgery. Um, or if it can be crushed, which can mean some very weird tastes uh, after surgery, I'm afraid. I normally say just put it on the, on the spoon with a little bit of um, yogurt or something like that and helps it go down. And if something's less than a 5p piece size anyway, so a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, cardiac drugs tend to be quite small, um, then you can take them. But it's a, a capsules, we try and avoid if we can. The capsules are quite handy because they they twist and you can, uh, there's a powder inside and you can pour it out. Um, and again, as I say, the pharmacy is brilliant because again, they are trained in understanding what you can do with 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 drugs and or not when you're changing the preparation um, so that you get the effect that you need. Sorry, I'm on mute, rookie mistake there. Next one. Okay. Yeah. Surgery is a tool for, um, surgery is a tool for long-term health and vitality. You could achieve things you never thought you could. Do you think this statement's true or false? Yay, yeah. Well, I'm so glad you all feel that way because this is obviously a statement that has come from one of our patients. So let's have a look on the next slide. Wow, they're flying in those answers. Yeah. So I wonder if you can guess which one is the actual person who's had bariatric surgery there. So if you want to put in man, woman, then you can. So I ran the Great Manchester um, Run 10K, took me over an hour. I felt great. I never, ever thought I'd be able to do that. So who do we think had it? Okay. You can't tell. Well, I know. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so it was the gentleman. The gentleman had had surgery. This gentleman um, 
is a, a university lecturer and he used to be invited on the television um, to talk about politics on some of the sessions and he said it was really quite interesting because when he was uh, overweight um, he would be invited onto the end of the sofa and, and then kind of when the session was ended he was just shown out and off he went but once he was slimmer he found that people treated him much better um, and he wasn't put on the very edge of the sofa anymore and he could hang around for a coffee and a cross on afterwards um which is really sad it's so so sad because i don't understand that at all i'm not here because i think thin people are happier or better because it's just not true i'm here because people want, uh, have a right to make a choice over their health and well-being and when people suffer with obesity it can be really debilitating so surgery is a fantastic way of um getting that kickstart to weight loss for meaningful changes for people so that's that's really what it's all about so i do think it's sad that weight stigma um really does still exist um, especially in a nation where uh, three out of four of us are overweight. So it's it's sort of something you'd think would be old. <laughs> so we've had lots of questions from people that it seems are new here tonight, um, asking how long it's going to be from from them being them starting with More Life or with um, any of the weight management services, ABL, um, and how long it's going to be from that day to them having surgery. And I think Jody touched upon this. Um, in a, in a standard journey with your services, you'll be with them for about 12 months. Um, and then from there, it's the waiting list with the surgery provider, which is Salford Royal. So I think Jody mentioned that from referral from us as the weight management service into Salford Royal, it's about seven months at the minute before you do see them. Um, in, in that, would that be a telephone appointment, Jodie, at the minute? Or would it be face to face? No, no. So that's that's the appointment. So yeah. um, you, you do spend a lot of time with your tier three weight management. And prior to surgery, you sp spend a surprisingly little amount of time with us, which is right, because you everything you should know, whatever you don't know, you're not going to know. And you definitely qualify for bariatric surgery. So we're not going to delay you in any way, um, especially because the delays are at the moment are mainly down to the NHS. So um, when you come to meet us, there's like a, 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 a Teams meeting where maybe there's five or six of us and I send out um, very specific education that I want you to read and watch. And then we do, uh, I have a checklist that I devised so you can kind of mentally ask yourself, do I know about this, do I know about that? And then you come along with family members or on your own or, or however you like with a, a small group of people. Um, for a question and answer session with me and Chris. Um, so it's just a little bit more personal and it's a place for you've looked at the education to think, all oh, right, okay, I wasn't too sure about this. And there's no wrong questions. No one's going to turn around to you and go, oh, you can't have it. You asked what protein was. Um, it's not like that at all. Um, and then the following week or a few weeks after, you actually come physically to the hospital. You have your bloods taken and your observations done. You meet your medic one-on-one. -on -one, so bring anything relevant with you, like your prescription, that sort of thing's really useful. And then you meet meet um, your surgeon and at that point we discuss what the best option of surgery will be uh, bypass sleeve and so on um, and then uh, there's a few things that that need to happen so you might need to have a psychology assessment which almost everybody has a sleep study which again almost everybody has so there was a question on there earlier going oh I've got sleep apnea can I have surgery yes yes you can and it will probably cure your sleep apnea so please have it um so we test everybody to see if if you've got something called sleep apnea don't be scared about about that um again it's a good reason to have the surgery if it's something you have um and I'll explain what that is and, and as we go through um I'm better understanding what sleep apnea is and how it affects people and if it's something that affects you that again wouldn't stop you from doing surgery and then when all those bits and bobs are done you go on to the individual waiting list um, and then we hope we'll hopefully have more information to tell you um, by that time about what's happening with surgery. Yeah thanks Jodie I think um, what I was going to say is if you've just started with your um, weight management provider so if you're with ABL more life if you're with um Wigan and Lee there's you know there's all of the um the weight management teams out there make sure you utilize that weight management 
program make sure you use us while you've got us there and um, not all of the services are able to offer follow-up support once they've um, referred you on to Salford in that interim period so you know really utilize the time that you've got um, also, some, some of the messages that are coming through in, in these sessions are geared around people that are at the point of having surgery, they are you know, coming up to the point of having surgery. We're inviting you into these meetings so you can get all of the information and be prepared well in advance. Um, and I would suggest that you continue to come to these sessions right up until the point that you do have surgery. You know, Jodie's an amazing asset and resource for you to tap into, so make sure that you do ask those questions and you are inquisitive as you are. But just know that you know there's not much we can do about the waiting list here at this meeting and we understand that you are frustrated but make sure we use this session to ask the questions about the surgery about the you know the pre-diet the post-diet what we're doing and we, we will give you an update every time we see you on the waiting list but make sure we you know you're really taking advantage of, of Jodie while you've got her here and the other professionals that do come to the sessions all right um, and we are working in the background on like a typical like an FAQ sheet that we can share with you all. Um, so hopefully we'll you know you will have that in the new year.